Welcome to another edition of the Let's Talk About Chess podcast. In episode number 16, I talked to Jeroen van den Berg, the tournament director of the Tata Steel Chess Tournament in Wijkanzee. He told me some great stories about the event. The Wimbledon of Chess, as the tournament in Wijkanzee is called, attracts the very best chess grandmasters in the world, and in non-COVID times, thousands of amateur players and visitors. During its 83 years of history, the Tata Steel Chess Tournament has attracted some of the biggest names in chess history. In this series, the Wijkanzee Storytellers, you can hear some legends of the game telling stories about the greatest chess tournament in the world. I am your host Erik van der Reem. Relax and enjoy the show. So, my next guest, dear listeners, in the Vikanze stories, who definitely has a lot to tell about the tournament in Vikanze, is Grandmaster Ian Rogers. He not only played in Vikanze, but as a writer and journalist, he has covered many tournaments in the small village, always accompanied by his lovely wife, Kathy, who provides the visuals that go with his words. From Sydney, Australia, welcome, Grandmaster Ian Rogers. G'day, how are you going? Hi, Ian. Hope, how are you doing at the moment? Uh, good. Yeah, enjoying the summer. You're enjoying the summer. Very good. Yeah, Vikanze. There's never summer in Vikanze. Just wise for it, I would say. I had so many winters in my life because of Vikanze. I would uh, come home for the winter in Australia and then I would have to go back again for Vikanze uh, for another winter. So I guess I might have had 20 consecutive winters at one point. Wow, well, that's, 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 that's good. It's so, horrible. Yeah, that, 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 that <laughs> could be horrible, but I just seen a lot of. T- great chest then in January so that makes up for it of course it's true almost yeah okay and do you know about how many uh, tournaments you you you, um, you visited if I can say how many tournaments well since 1977 I guess I've missed six or eight so a lot yeah that's quite a lot yeah Cool. And we're talking about 1977. It was your first uh, tournament in Vikanze. Uh, you were six. You were 16 at the time. Indeed, I just come from the World Junior Championship in Groningen, uh, where I played quite well. I was equal first with three rounds to play, but got a bit crazy against uh, my co-leader uh, Lubo Fatashnik and uh, then uh, collapsed a bit. And uh, my second in that tournament was Robert Jamison, and he had been invited to the B group in Vakanze. Uh, because uh, uh, there was a, a Dutch journalist, uh, Jules Welling, who had very good connections with Australia, and he uh, suggested that they should invite an Australian player to the tournament. They thought it was a good idea. So Jamison uh, came, and I was lucky enough to play in the C group uh, while Jamison was playing in the B group, but really my job was as a second for Robert Jamison. Okay. As a 16-year-old, you were already a second for Jamison. Indeed, yes. Um, I've done quite a bit of seconding work. I think I was about 20 or 21 when I seconded um, Igor Ivanov in the uh, interzonal tournament in Toluca. And uh, no, it's it's a lot of fun. And you learn a lot from being a second. Okay. And how did uh, Jameson do in the B group? Uh, he did quite well. He finished on minus one, which is about where he should have been on rating. But he did win the uh, or share the Leo van Kerk Prize for the most brilliant game of the tournament, which was the first time it had ever gone to the B group instead of the A group. Uh, but his game against uh, Juan Bellon uh, was extremely spectacular, if anyone wants to look it up. Uh, really, really fantastic. And uh, so he was very satisfied with that. Um, he uh, kept insisting that uh, it was a beauty prize directed at him, not for his chess game, but for his appearance. But, uh, well, back in Australia, they almost believed him. <laughs> okay. Very good. And you played in the, I, I looked it up in the, in the chess magazine, Schrag Bulletin, number 111, the best <laughs> chess, tour, chess, chess magazine ever, I think. Uh, you played in, in the Reserve Group, they called it. Yes. And you, and you won eight games, eight out of nine, it isn't was, it? It was a big surprise, yes. In fact, uh, on the next rating list, I was the top-rated 16-year-old in the world after getting eight out of nine there in my World Junior results. But uh, in fact, uh, I was a little bit lucky. Uh, someone, I think in the last round, uh, I had a winning pawn ending and they should have played it badly. They should have drawn it. And uh, I was chased all the way by Johan van Bala, who uh, lost in the last round. Uh, after I won, because he was so disappointed, he thought he would be coming equal first. Um, 
and uh, well, the the big thing about that was in fact that uh, it was played in the basement. Uh, we they weren't playing in Demorian at the time. I think it was uh, in uh, the, oh in, in Nin another nineteen eighty another venue seventy seven yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, it was anyway. There was a basement area for the lower groups, like the reserve groups. And uh, at one point, I noticed everyone uh, looking around and standing directly behind me, looking at my game, was this really tall old guy. And uh, it uh, turned out I was told later that it was well. Actually, I only found out when I got back to Australia. It was Max Erva, uh, and he'd been asked by an old friend, Cecil Purdy, to keep an eye on my games. Uh, so he turned up in the basement for the first time and uh, just kept an eye and wrote back to Cecil Purdy saying, yeah, it looks like he's okay. And uh, But I didn't know about that until Cecil wrote to me and said, well, Max Serva said this. So, But every, of course, everyone else in the basement knew precisely who Max Serva was. Remember in those days, uh, all you had was, say, informant. You had no idea what people looked like. Chess magazines had very few photos. There were no videos to watch. So every player, apart from, I mean, you, you didn't even know how to pronounce their name, let alone what they looked like. So, uh, so in fact, Max Yui was the person standing behind me, <laughs> according to everyone in Australia. And when I said Irva, because I learned how to say it, uh, no one would understand what you were talking about anyway. So you had to say Yui, and then people would understand. Yeah, Yui, Max Yui, yeah, it's yeah, the great uh, Dutch uh, world champion and FIDE, um, um, FIDE president, uh, indeed. FIDE president, indeed, he was at the time. Mm. He wasn't anymore at the time, was he? Was uh, he 77, he probably was. Um, yes, I think he was, because in 78, I um, managed to, well, what happened was uh, after I won the reserve group, there was a crisis in the steel industry. It was already a crisis in 77, but by 78, they basically had, only, like this year, only the top group and no subsidiary group, no women's tournament. And uh, as a result of that, uh, I think I got invited many months later to a tournament in Airbake. And after that, I came to Amsterdam and uh, Uh, I, at some point, I got a bit lost in Amsterdam, found the FIDE office, and uh, I was uh, well looked after there. Uh, in fact, they forced me to ring home when I, they discovered I hadn't rung my family since I got to the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and Max, Max Erva was there. And also, I'm trying to remember the name of the secretary who was uh, uh, in, the, the, the woman. Um, Inika Bakker. Yeah. Inika Bakker, indeed. And she was wonderful. She looked after me like uh, I didn't know what I was doing, which was absolutely true. And uh, yeah, because I was by myself. And it was, uh, yeah, she was wonderful to me. So I was very sad when Max lost the presidency and Inika Bakker, uh, a few years afterwards, I think, uh, left. Yeah, that's right. How was it then? Because you were 16 at the time? Going to, 16, to, going, a, going to was, Europe. Okay, you did. It was not your first trip abroad from away from Australia, no, I guess. That's but right. To go, World Cadet Championships. But to Europe? Was it that the first time? Or oh, not? definitely. Um, no, because the World Cadet Championships were in France. Ah, but sure. and, and also, I mean, uh, I did have uh, Robert Jamison with me. So, But to be honest, when we got to Groningen and uh, on the second day it started snowing, we both ran out to see what was going on because neither of us had seen any snow in our whole life. And uh, so we started throwing snowballs at each other because we knew that's what you were supposed to do when it snowed. And all the other players thought we were extremely immature and crazy. But, uh, but it was very weird seeing snow for the first time. Yeah. Uh, and of course, back in those days, Vacanzo was a lot colder than it is nowadays. Yeah, yeah I can remember 1990, no, what was it, 2000, when I interviewed uh, Hare Krishna, when he was the first time in, uh, in Vacanzo, he saw also saw snow for the first time, and he was also perplexed. Mm. To, to, well, what is this? Yeah, it was absolutely crazy. Yeah. I think a lot of Perhaps a lot of players see snow for the first time. First time. But you also it saw, is. but as you said, you saw some of the great uh, grandmasters for the first time. In, Indeed. Uh, in in, uh, in well, Valkanze. Uh, was it exactly what you imagined, how it would look like? Um, well, I, I realized at that time that in order to be a really strong grandmaster, you had to smoke a lot. Um, and uh, Geller was the classic example of that. I had seen one strong grandmaster up in Groningen, that was the American second, uh, Lubosz Kowalek. But uh, the only other strong players I saw were the long-haired English pair of uh, Mestel and Stil Spillman, who I'd heard of and I knew had long hair, but Spillman was thrown out after the first round of the World Junior anyway, so there was only uh, Mestel left. So that, that was about the, the limit of the top players I'd seen. And uh, then suddenly we get there and there's the 
Sonko and uh, there's well even even in the B group there was Kuprachek who I knew of and uh, so it was it was wonderful to suddenly yeah um, put put uh, faces to names. Mm -hmm. Did you have the opportunity to, to see to see the games or to follow the games a bit? Because you said you were uh, playing in the basement, more or less, in the hotel right. Ken, Kenna Medina. No? They moved to the in, in Morian day. in 1980 in the in the in the main hall, in the big hall where everybody played in the same same that, venue. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we were sort of in the same venue. It's just, I, but okay. I, what I was very lucky with was when my games were finished, I would come upstairs, and very often Jamison would be finishing, and I could watch his post mortem with uh, with his opponents. So he had a number of long games, uh, for example, against Paul van der Stere, who I think scored his maybe his final international master norm in the tournament. Certainly did extremely well. Uh, came in second. Kuprachek won very very easily, yeah. and so all the players in the B group I got to know, uh, and that that was that was enough for me. But also in the closing ceremony, uh, we were all sitting at tables, and the grandmasters and the IMs were mixing a bit. So I had a number of grandmasters that I didn't dare speak to at the table, but at least I was able to n know who they were by then. And of course, the the whole closing ceremony was completely delayed because Geller was trying to win a three versus two rook end game and it went on and on and on so they basically presented every prize except first prize and finally at about 10 o'clock at night or maybe even later Geller turned up got a round of applause and he shared first prize with Sasonko but uh it, yeah they I mean it was my first time having urd for soup pea soup uh so there were a lot of a lot of firsts there and of course as a player not in the IM or GM group back in those days everybody else was billeted with a local person oh that was the other thing about the closing ceremony of mm -hmm. course it was like a village festival with uh or everyone invited basically to a massive closing ceremony where there'd be pea soup and i laid it, i discovered that was a tradition from the second world war or period just after the second world war when there wasn't a lot of food around but um an english player and i were billeted with a lovely old lady who was obsessed by the Eurovision Song Contest, which you may not know, in 1977 was in January. So uh, both of us were <coughs> sat down in the evening to uh, watch watch this music festival. And to be honest, after that, I, I developed a great liking for it, I guess, because it was associated with very fond memories. But the British player hated it. And he was muttering, you know, uh, I never watched the Eurovision Song Contest. It's horrible, but I, I have to be polite. And uh, so uh, there were, but anyway, it was, it was a lot of fun. The, uh, the lady of the house, I, I think she'd come to the Netherlands about 40 years ago from Great Britain. So she had perfect English and uh, she uh, came along to the closing ceremony. And it was just a, uh, a really interesting way of, of getting to know the locals by staying there. And basically everyone who played the, the lower groups there, who wasn't already from uh, that area, was able to stay. Uh, you'd go into the office and there'd be a, a list of 100 players or more matching up to 100 locals who'd offered their house. And uh, it was it was really uh, very, very impressive. The organisation was much more difficult in a way back then because you involved all the locals. And uh, so providing accommodation for hundreds is, is much tougher than the easy job they've got now. Yeah, although there are not yes. that many hotels at the moment, still not that <laughs> many hotels in Vikansen. No, no, but it's uh, true. It, but... Yeah, yeah, it is still. I know that a lot of quite of, a lot of amateur players still stay well with the locals. Then still, they still do. Yes, no, yes, not this yeah, year, but... of course, of course. But in the in the, mm. they're building up a kind of re relationship with the locals and come back exactly, every year. Yes. Yeah. I'm not sure when it stopped. I think it was late 80s or early 90s when the organisers decided we didn't need this extra work. And uh, it was also when the tournament became more professional, I guess. And uh, they started trying to become a, a much more elite tournament. Uh, but even in 77, Karpov was supposed to come. Yeah. But late in 1976, uh, a guy called Korshnoi decided to uh, visit the... Uh, um, what was it, the Bevolkingsregister in uh, Amsterdam and asked for political asylum. And uh, the the guy who looked after Korshnoi uh, a little over 10 years later greeted Cathy and myself when he looked at our form and said, oh, chess players. Yes, I had a chess player here a few years ago. Um, his name was Korshnoi and he asked for political <laughs> asylum. And I said, yes. And uh, so uh, he said, look, your your situation in the Netherlands is very tricky, but... 
basically don't worry because if they ever question your status, they'll send you to me and I'll tell you to go away again. So uh, don't, don't worry that you've got an uncertain status. And that, that, that worked living in the Netherlands until our various departments bought a computer and discovered that we're allowed to vote in local elections, but not in national elections. And they, the computer thought that was a little bit strange. And so we had a visit before we could finalize our, our, our status in the Netherlands. Did you know that Kochnoy and Karpov both were invited for the 1977 tournament? No, I didn't know about Kochnoy. Oh, okay. They were both, but uh, and, yeah, and I think Kochnoy couldn't play. I, I don't know for what reason. Maybe he had to play somewhere else. But and it, and the organizers were a bit uh, well. Karpov was supposed to come, but they were a bit surprised that Geller came out of the uh, airplane. Then, but, yeah. indeed. Well, mm. that uh, might have been because. Uh, Karpov didn't want Korshnoi, uh yeah. to be in the, he feared Korshnoi would turn up, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, Geller wasn't such a bad trade. Back in those days, he was an uh, extremely serious player. Yeah, and he won the tournament together with Sosunko. They both scored eight points out of... Um, yes, and was it Timon just behind them, I think? Timon, seven and a half, yeah. Yeah. And, and were uh, some other uh, yeah, well-known players like Olafsson from Iceland, of course, uh, Tony Miles, Kavalek, Nikolic, hmm. all... Yes, that was a very young Nikolic, yeah. Oh, no, it was Nikolak. Nikolak? Sorry, that was not Nikolic. Oh, Nikolak, Nikolak, sorry. Nik yeah, yeah Nikolak, um, yeah, he was uh, the mystery person on uh, the recent Christmas quiz by the Max Server Centre, uh, <laughs> okay. which people found hard to identify. But, uh, yeah, and he, Nikolak had the distinction of being the oldest person ever to become a grandmaster until they started giving it away at the World Senior Championship. So he finally earned his grandmaster title, I think, at 49. And I don't believe there's, uh, maybe subsequently there's been a 50-year-old grandmaster through norms, but I'm not sure. So he held that record for a long time. Okay, Nicole Luck. Okay, so... <laughs> very good. Yeah, it's not very easy to find some information about these tournaments anymore. And it's from the 70s. We, well, okay, we had some tournament books, of course, mm. but uh, these are not that easy to, to find. You can also only find it in databases, Indeed. of but course. The, the, the tournament books were very good, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, and in fact, there's a tournament book about the Groningen World Junior. There's, yeah, there's tournament books about the uh, Amsterdam um, tournaments. Uh, basically, every major event in the Netherlands got its own tournament book back in those days. So they're a wonderful uh, reference source. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in 1977, after you played the tournament and you saw all the grandmasters, was it a decision you made that I want to be a professional chess player? Um. <clears throat> Possibly, yeah, because the previous three tournaments I'd played, including Corona, it's just it had just been myself and other juniors, and some of us you know, were okay, and some were better than others. I mean, the the absolute star at the World Cadet was a an Israeli player called Nir Grinberg, <clears throat> who uh, I think Kasparov. Uh, with White took a very short draw within the last round because it, Grinberg was clearly a future world champion. And of course, these things don't always happen. And uh, Grinberg, I believe, never went above 2350 in his whole career. But uh, he looked an absolute superstar in the, in the World Cadet, which was filled with players further down that uh, did become grandmasters and so on. So, uh, yeah, you get a false impression from junior tournaments. But when you see these players, and especially when you watch the post-mortems and you see how far they've seen and how good their opening preparation is I think Rob Hartock beat Robert Jamison in a game with superb opening preparation and uh, you began to realize that uh, there was a different level of chess being played and if you wanted to be good you had to go there but uh, I I did uh, I, I mean I was under a lot of pressure to continue not turn professional and go to university so I did um, I took nearly five years to do a three-year course because the exams were always at the same time as the Olympiad um, and uh, I didn't miss any Olympiads. So uh, it was, and at the end of it, I said, I'll give myself two years to see how I go as a professional player. And I was having so much fun after two years that I gave myself another two years. And uh, then I realized that uh, this was a lot better prospect than trying to get a job in Australia at, uh, at that, that period of time. There was very high unemployment. 
Um, I graduated in meteorology and only two mm. members of our class got a job in meteorology. So the prospects were not very good since I definitely wasn't one of those top two. So it was, uh, it was, it was very uh, difficult back then uh, and easier to become a professional in the same way that, you know, during the Margaret Thatcher years in England, England went from, I don't know, three grandmasters to 19 grandmasters, just because it was a more attractive profession than sitting around being unemployed. Yeah. And did you also get some some uh, support from the Australian Chess Federation at the time? Uh, occasionally, yeah. I, I'm the you know your airfare would be, let's say fifteen hundred dollars, and maybe you'd get five hundred dollars. But it was also around the period in seventy seven when I came back. I started playing really well. I won two big tournaments, which had five hundred dollars first each, and suddenly I had enough money. That's Yeah, that could get me just about get me to Europe or at least to Asia. Um, yeah, back then air, air tickets were very expensive. I think I paid fourteen hundred dollars to go to the zonal in Japan um, return, and uh, yeah, that was yeah typical. Although I discovered later that real professionals like Max Fuller would buy a ticket to England via Japan uh, and then pay two hundred dollars less. Uh, so. And you could throw away the part to England if you wanted to. So, the, yeah, I, I gradually learned that you, you know, you needed to find cheap ways. And when Kathy and I first went to Europe, we left from Perth. We got a three hundred dollar ticket from Perth to Singapore, and then we went looking at Aeroflot, and eventually we went Romanian Airways to Rom, uh, which was the cheapest to Europe, and that uh, landed us in uh, in Zurich, and then uh, one way, and then we could do the rest ourselves. Okay, <laughs> so, quite adventurous uh, yeah. times. Of, uh, yeah. yeah, well, But, it's not, nothing, nothing compared to, say, Daryl Johansson, who basically said you would, you'd fly to Fiji and then you'd get a series of boats to Hawaii <laughs> and then you could get a $100 uh, standby ticket from Hawaii to LA. Uh, I mean, I did use the $100 standby ticket, but I never used the boats. But uh, that is, that was the cheapest way to get to the US, so definitely. <laughs> And when did you decide to move then to get an apartment in, in the Netherlands, in, in Amsterdam? Uh, Because was it, it was easier for you, of course, to, to visit uh, European uh, tournaments, of course. Well, the problem was if we didn't have a base in Europe, then we would have to play nonstop. Uh, for an, a number of years, around about uh, 83, 4, 5, we stayed in a back room of Murray Chandler's house. Uh, at some point, we stayed with Yvette Nachel in Amsterdam. But it's not uh, so nice, you know, sleeping Uh, on pe on mattresses on people's floors and this sort of thing and uh, so we realized that if I was going to stay as a professional and not just play non-stop because when you played you, they paid your accommodation so that made a big difference uh, uh, so ultimately yeah I, um, we bought a, a flat in Amsterdam we were actually looking at uh, Belgrade or northern Spain or Belgium because we'd heard all of them were very cheap um, And we almost bought in Belgrade until we discovered that foreigners couldn't actually own property there, mm -hmm. or it was very tricky, uh, which was lucky because the wars broke out two years later. Uh, but a, a Dutch friend said, well, if you're looking at um, uh, Belgium, look at Amsterdam, it's very cheap. And so ultimately, uh, we found a place three doors, three floors down from Paul van der Steren while he was away at a tournament. Uh, it was about 40,000 uh, guilders, which I guess today is about... 18,000 euros or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we bought it. And when he got back from the tournament, we were neighbors. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cheap in Amsterdam. This doesn't sound that it fits. <laughs> well, Amsterdam uh, and cheap, that, that's not possible at the moment. Well, put, put, it, put, put, it, put it this way. Um, yeah. We bought in the same block of flats as Paul van der Steren and Hanneke van Pereren, and we paid about 40% less than they did because prices had been coming down for eight or nine years. Oh, sure. um, so that was house prices back in the 70s. Uh, it's a little bit different now. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, you've been to, also been closer to Vikings of course, when you're living in Amsterdam, so it was easier to yes, travel indeed. there. Um, not without a car. Not without a car. <laughs> well, it's it an hour and three quarters by public transport. Can you um, des describe when you go to Vikingsee? I think it's a bit when you drive to Vikingsee, it's kind of traveling to the end of the world. Go to Vikingsee, go to the hotel, go to the Morian, and that's it actually, because you have to. There is, it's, it's, it's a, there is a U turn, and then you have to go back actually. So that's the kind of the end of the world. But uh. in, indeed, well, in fact, the way we usually went was to get a, a tram to uh, the uh, 
railway station and then a, a train to uh, two trains one to Slater Dyke one to Bavervake then a bus the bus is never coordinated with the trains uh, and yeah it would be an hour and three quarters each way but uh, so if you left at say quarter to seven you could get home half past eight and have dinner and it, it, it was very tough but of course not nothing compared to playing in Groningen and staying in Amsterdam mm -hmm. which uh, was you know, two and three quarter hours uh, each way but I was so successful in Groningen commuting that uh, I, I kept doing it even when I didn't have to uh, and uh, so yeah it's Look, it, the distances are, are not a lot compared to Australia, so it's not so terrible. And if you have to travel on public transport for a long way, you pull out an informata, you uh, prepare for your opponent, and then you're ready to play when you get there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like I can say, let's go back a bit to like I can say, what is, you've seen so many fantastic games, of course. Can you tell me what is the most memorable game you you, you saw? Oh, Jamison against Bellon. Uh, that, that was uh, definitely uh, the most spectacular game I've seen. Uh, and it was, uh, yeah, it, it was only the B group, but it was simply a great game. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't recall anything as, um, well, like two cavemans going at each other. And uh, that's the sort of chess I'm happy to see. Mm -hmm. So people should look it up to the, they shouldn't do, not only look at Kasparov against Topalov 1999. Which, yeah, well, uh, that was a little, little bit one-sided. I mean, uh, only one person was really attacking there. But uh, the, uh, this other game, both sides were, were trying for the win extremely hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So people should look it up. Yeah, they should uh, mm, absolutely. look at the 1977. <laughs> Seven, uh, B group. <laughs> B group. Yep. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, that's great. I'm going to look it up uh, as well, of course. Um, well, anything, what I would like, I always like to ask is if, if it would be possible to, to take a time machine and go back to one of the tournaments in Vikansee, which one would you go to? I think um, you will, we were going to say 1977 because it's your first. No, no, I, th I think um, the, was, was it uh, 2001? Was this the one where Kasparov started with eight and a half out of nine or nine and a half out of 10? There was, um, there was 99, I think. 99. Oh, that was he started 99, was it? He started seven and a half out of eight. Half and, out then, of eight. and then he met uh, Mr. Uh, Ivan uh, Sokolov. Sokolov. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, no, that was that was a lot of fun seeing how far he'd go in the same way that the Sinkfield Cup when Caruana had started his long streak was just amazing to watch. And uh, yeah, the... the um, the finishes in Vacancy have often been a little bit disappointing. You know, the leader takes a draw and then it's a question whether someone can catch up to them. But uh, but every so often uh, someone takes a, a big lead and uh, that's, that's always interesting to watch. But yes, uh, being there when uh, so Sokolov was uh, looking at uh, the, uh, his game with Kasparov and explaining it to everyone, that was, uh, that was also very interesting because uh, I, I couldn't believe how confident uh, Sokolov was. Uh, you know, he never doubted himself for one minute. And uh, I began to realise that is his great strength, that he simply believes that most of his moves are really good. And uh, to be optimistic is, is a huge advantage in chess. I'm, I'm a bit of a pessimist personally, mm. um, having started out as an optimist. Uh, but realizing that uh, yeah, you, you're not as good as you think you are. But on, especially on that day, Sokolov proved that he knew exactly what he was doing and it didn't matter who he was playing, he was better than them. Okay, that's good. Yeah, and he won against uh, Kasparov and Kasparov was a bit, uh, well, how do you say it? No, not, not pleased, let, let me say it, put it this way. He's had a lot of moments in Vacanze when he's stormed out. Mm -hmm. um, not, not always losses, too. Uh, he, yeah, he, he gets upset at the smallest thing, you know, a tie break going against him or almost anything. So, uh, yeah, he's uh, one, of, uh, one of the things I'm used to is standing outside the players' room uh, ready to interview someone and uh, he grabs his coat and hat and storms out past everyone and uh, uh, for, for no particular reason but uh, yeah he yeah he has his good days and his bad days but uh, he he wants everyone to know when he's having a bad day yeah, especially when he doesn't do, to be gets uh, gets the, the the award from the audience because uh, you know that those, 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 those yes. stories right uh, that, yes. that, that, during the commentary the uh, people I don't know how long it was, but they could vote for for the best game of the day in the tent or in the commentary in, room. In, and in if, the tent, that's right. In the tent, yes. Yes, and uh, 
Because Prowse was not, not always awarded the... We the should prize. explain the tent was a wonderful place where uh, you had about f up to 4,000 people, endless beer and commentary. Uh, the commentary was perhaps the least important thing. People were there to meet each other after a year and uh, it was the best social uh, place until it started blowing away as the winds got stronger. So uh, eventually they got rid of the tent. Also budget cuts meant that they had to get mm. rid of the tent as well. But it, it was uh, during the Kasparov era, uh, it was, he won three in a row and that was, uh, they, they would have something like 7,000 spectators uh, on weekends. Uh, you know, 4,000 cramming into the tent and then others cramming into De Morian and when someone left, someone else could come in and it, it was uh, it was fantastic, really fantastic. Yeah, it's great times. And yeah, people did not always vote, as I said, for the Kasparov game because for one reason no, well, or another. To be honest, in the in the last informant, my Rogers Reminiscences article is all about Kasparov not winning the beauty prize in Linares in 2003, which he was also not happy about. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, he, look, the guy wanted to win everything. Yeah. There, <clears throat> and um, if he didn't, there was something wrong, not with him, but with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that applied to the audience as well. They simply didn't have his sophistication uh, or or other attributes to understand how wonderful he was. Yeah, let's have a final word about this this year's edition, which is completely different, of course. Only uh, there's only one group. Uh, are you able to follow all the games? Uh, yes, but uh, since I start at midnight, I must admit I haven't been following them all live. I've been waking up early and uh, watching the end of the round rather than trying to uh, stay up through the night. Mm -hmm. So this this year's tournament, well, uh, look, nobody is in great shape. Uh, and I suspect that's because nobody's played much uh, over the board chess for quite a while. I would think that in the final five or six rounds, the the top class players start moving away from the the second level players because you've only got, I think, six out of the 14 in the world's top 30. And normally you'd expect Car Caruana and Carlson to get big scores against these guys. Now, a number of them are simply very well prepared for the top guys. So uh, I'll be very interested to see how Van Forest goes tonight, for example, uh, against Carlson, because I think he'll be as well prepared and uh, it, it could be very interesting. But ultimately, uh, I would expect the cream to rise to the top and that will be uh, Caruana and, and Carlson and possibly Giri and maybe Vache as well, though he hasn't looked so good yet. Yeah, okay. Well, we will see what happens if I can say, and uh, but we see what happens next year. I hope that we uh, will be able to to visit if I can say again. Are you planning? It to would come be great, to... wouldn't it? You will, yeah, but you will also will be there again, hopefully, if possible. Well, I, I hope so. At the moment, it's not uh, legal for me to leave Australia, mm -hmm. and yesterday the. Uh, one of the health officials said he thought the borders would not be open until the end of the year. But that still gives me a chance to go in January. So we'll see how we go. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, Ian, thank you very much for your time. I hope to see you next year again, if I can say. Absolutely. Hope so too. Thanks, Take care, Eric. Stay healthy and uh, hope to see you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Dear listeners, I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the podcast. It is always a pleasure to talk to chess legends about their games and experiences especially when they're talking about my favorite tournament. If you have any questions or suggestions, leave a tweet at chessclassic or send a mail to talkingchess at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. I am your host Erik van Reem. Thank you very much for listening.